machine learning is moving in very interesting directions and we want Kaggle to continue to move uh, with where machine learning more broadly is moving. And so Wendy is going to talk to you about some of the exciting things that we have uh, upcoming on Kaggle. So I'm going to pass over to Wendy. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to Kaggle Days. I, I am Wendy. I'm a data scientist on the competitions team. Um, usually when I give a talk about Kaggle, I ask people um, how many of you have heard of Kaggle, and I realize here it doesn't apply anymore, so we'll ask more advanced questions. Raise your hand if you have ever joined a Kaggle competition. Very good. Raise your hand if you have ever uploaded a data set. Whoa. Um, raise your hand if you have used Kaggle kernels. Keep your hand up if you have used a GPU <laughs> on Kaggle kernels. Uh, cool. Uh, raise your hand if you have taken any classes on Kaggle Learn. Great. Um, thank you all for using Kaggle. We are very excited. Um, I'm very excited to be here. Um, it's my first Kaggle days. Um, we have uh, been most known for data science and machine learning competitions, and over the past several years, I think it's close to 10, 10 years now, um, we've seen some tremendous growth on Kaggle, and we've hosted a lot of competitions uh, with very big names. We've hosted a lot of competitions on various different kinds of predictive models, optimization problems, um, with a lot of our great sponsors for these problems. Um, we've ha facilitated some explosive growth uh, of machine learning models. Um, I love this, uh, for this talk I dug through, um, 2012 winner uh, blog post of Merck competition. And this is where Jeff Hinton's group won the competition and showed the, kind of showed the community how deep learning works. And after that, it just really took off. And uh, um, before that, not a lot of people, I mean, neural nets were invented way before, but not a lot of people were winning with deep learning. But after that, at, and, and now basically at every computer vision competition, you'll see deep learning dominating. Uh, and he just won the 2019 Turing Award. Um, we also, as Anthony said, we also saw tools uh, gain popularity on Kaggle because of our outreach and our community. Um, tools that are very good get exposed to to the community and get popularity. Uh, one great example is XG Boost. Um, it started to dominate Kaggle, and I was just randomly searching on the, all these blog posts, and everybody was talking about XG Boost, and all, all the blog posts were mentioning as dominating Kaggle. It started in 2000, it was released in 2014, and onwards it got very popular. The other one, um, we're very lucky to have the author, Francois, talking today. Uh, is Keras. Keras was released in 2015, and um, it very quickly got the popularity with our community. And I was doing a Google search and saw that, you know, it it, it kind of grew with TensorFlow, but definitely was was uh, was the dominating thing on Kaggle. Um, and even now, people really love using Keras. Um, I didn't just plot whatever exponential graph here, I actually plot <laughs> a real data from 2010 to 2019. Tremendous growth of the community. Um, we grew from basically nothing to now close to 3 million people on the platform. We're also a very engaged community. Um, even the monthly logging users keeps growing up. Um, now it's uh, well over 300,000 login users monthly. Um, We've, Why is it oscillating? What's that? Why does it oscillate? Uh, you tell me. Why are you not logging in? <laughs> um, we feel like a flourishing community, and uh, a, it, it helps companies. It's like it's a virtuous circle where the community is flourishing, and we have a lot of curious and engaged data scientists, and it helps companies. Um, with researchers, with data and problems, to have better problems to offer to the community. And the community is more engaged because there are all these different types of problems that are offered to the platform. So um, 
I love dogs. So it's like the community is, are like these individuals that are sitting in front of their computers. Um, but um, the companies are the dog conference where they have all these problems for people to solve. Um, and we also see a company, when a company does business with Kaggle, um, it's a good indicator that puts them on the maps in front of the world to say that they're very, very happy to adopt a, a machine learning and AI. We also have seen tremendous success from our users. Um, a lot of people thank Kaggle for getting their jobs. Um, oh, I saw this uh, uh, article on Wired featuring our top Kaggler at the time, Giba, um, that he was uh, watching job offers flowing in because he was doing very well on Kaggle. Um, Kaggle kernels is one of the things that uh, when we first rolled out, it was controversial. Competition users were not sure about it, um, about sharing code. Uh, but now, kernel authors, kernel keeps growing. And um, even I do now, a lot of times when I want to solve a problem, I just need to look at some code samples. I go to kernels and I copy some code. Um, and uh, we keep growing. So we have now a lot of resources uh, that we can offer kernels only competitions. We can offer GPU resources for people. Um, I love this meme of just everyone gets a free GPU. Um, so yeah, so I want to switch gear a little bit. On, uh, so those are known facts about Kaggle. Probably you're not reminded every day when you're on Kaggle. Um, I want to switch gear to a little bit on what I have been working on and we have been working on. We want to bring the, the most current in ML to our community. Um, and we're, we're always pushing that front line of what is possible to our community. So for me personally, I have always been very interested in generative models. So I really want to bring it to Kaggle. Um, the reason that I was interested in generative models is, is because of my job. I design competitions and a lot of times I need to poison the data with a lot of fake data. Uh, <laughs> um, so I've done multiple things, and uh, this technology called GAN, Generative Adversarial uh, Nets, have been on my radar for a while because I haven't seen anything so good in terms of generating um, different types of data. Um, the author, one of the authors would actually be speaking, Bing is in the, in the author list. Um, they are, they're drastically different and they're drastically uh, better in my opinion, um, but are they really better? So it's just kind of like we, we, when, when a model and a method is better, we kind of want to prove it on Kaggle. So I really want to bring it to the community. Um, we also already have a lot of GAN contacts on, uh, contents on kernels and uh, they're really fun. Um, I pulled this graph that GAN contents started to be really popular after, um, after 2000, end of 2016, I think. Um, the, the thing that didn't load on the right is, uh, is GAN really quickly gained um, a lot of interest uh, on, on, in the research community. So I took a screenshot of me just scroll, scrolling through a list of acronyms of different types of GAN. And it took a really long time to even scroll through. I think they're running out of um, letters for different kinds of C GANs, B GANs, like all these alpha GANs. Um, so what is it? Um, it's, uh, it's basically these uh, two networks that are adversarial, so they're, um, so they're kind of attacking each other and working together. I like the analogy that a GAN is basically like a, um, the, the original is, is like police and a criminal. Um, but I, I like the more peaceful analogy of a teacher and a student because we're Kaggle, we're doing, we're learning things together. So the generator is like a student and the, uh, and the discriminator is like a teacher. So this is a generator. So you put an input in and supposedly this generator is a neural network that can give you an output of, let's say, images or text. Um, and uh, that's the final goal. We want this generator to generate content that are good for, that, that makes sense for humans. Um, 
the basic idea of GAN for this generator is that you give this vector, have an input vector in. In this example, it's a conditional GAN. So um, you can see that the generator has uh, input that are determining, uh, that are telling you different things. For example, you, you, you probably have seen these demos of uh, conditional GANs of face generation where you can control if you want to add like glasses to this person or like a pointy nose or mustache, um, those are in the input vectors. And this generator is a neural network that will um, generate a high dimensional vector, which is an image in this example. The discriminator is the teacher. So the discriminator takes this image that the generator take, uh, generated and say, oh, I'm going to give you an answer of how good this thing that you generated is. So in this example, um, the discriminator says, well, I'm just going to, I have some training data in my pocket. I have these answer sheets. So if whatever you generate looks like a real, like basically anything that I have in my answer sheet is a one. And anything that you generate must be bad. So you see on the bottom line, it's like, not as good quality, so I'll give you basically a zero. For those of you, zero and one, so it's like a two-class classification problem. Um, combining the generator and the discriminator in this way, in a lot of iterations on the steps that I just talked about, where is we give the generator some random, vo random noise as an input vector, ask it to generate a fake image, and then we grade it with a training set to the discriminator to train the discriminator to learn with the generator. So it's kind of like this teacher and the student are learning together and growing together. It's actually working really well. So this is my example on MNIST. Um, it's, it's very quick, it just took a few minutes. Um, and running, you, you see that it's from Epoch Zero, um, it looks like random mo noise and when it when the epochs number go larger and larger, you see that um, the generator is able to learn and generate these handwritten digits. And that's like pretty recognizable. So um, those was pretty, pretty quick. There's a lot of GAN contents on Kaggle already. Um, this was from one of the Happy Whale participants that wanted to do data augmentation and took um, the whale tail images and decided to run GAN on them. So they ran uh, 39,000 39, epochs. And you can see these are the generated images. They're, they look, I would say they look pretty real to me. Um, of course, it's like the quality of it, the quality of them are not as good. So this is the, this is the state of the art. Um, I think it'll be published like in, in two weeks, but the paper is already out. This is called Big GAN, the state of the art. Um, you see these images first, they're big. Um, the, the size of the images is actually really important in terms of how, how much compute you get. Um, you see that they, they actually look really amazing. Um, uh, I think they're 512 by 512 images. So, and they actually um, are scoring really high on um, the current state of the art. Uh, uh, evaluation metrics. So, so with that, I decided to do some experiments myself, just like what I do usually when I design competitions. I try to run some benchmark. So of course, I said, I want to generate some dogs. And um, I find it really fun. I tried very different network infrastructures. Um, and I just really had to pull myself back from going in and tuning more, um, which is always a good sign that it's a, it's a successful type of competition that gets people interested and wanting to work on it. Um, uh, and uh, as you see, my experiments uh, didn't work very well, although I kind of stretched it such that I, I, I feel like I was generating dogs. I think the bottom, the fourth from the bottom left kind of looked like a border collie puppy. <laughs> so, <laughs> So <laughs> um, anyway, I had to really stop myself and think about um, how I really wanted to run this competition. Um, there are different kinds of GAN applications, but we wanted to do something simple. But here are the possibilities of 
what again competition or what again can do for different applications. For example, it could go from photo editing, like you could just from a sketch, you could go from there to like a full picture uh, with colors, or it could go from a, um, a satellite map to uh, abstract map. Um, and you've seen the images that people have generating like all this, like a random picture that applies to like a Van Gogh painting style. Um, these are again applications that are pretty amazing and they're taking advantage of that input output vectors that I was talking about. So that goes back to why is it hard to run a GAN competition? So we go back to um, uh, a generative model is really hard to evaluate. So um, first, like we don't even know what do we want to generate? Is it image or text? Um, in this example, I decided to go to image uh, because it's a little bit more established in the automatic uh, evaluation. Um, it's also really easy to cheat if you think about it. If I ask you to generate a bunch of dog pictures for me, you're all going to search on the internet and find like the first 10,000 pictures and submit them. So I, I need this to be a kernels only competition with the internet cut off um, because it's so easy and so tempting to cheat. Um, the evaluation challenges is also interesting because the best way to evaluate a generative model is human evaluation. So we want people to say, that looks good, that looks bad, but it's just not feasible. If everybody is joining the competition, we, there's no way that we can have people evaluate so many images and in real time. Um, so we are not even considering that route. It's also not very fair that way. Um, automatic and automatic evaluation is very difficult, um, and I'll talk about it. There's research going on with this, and my conclusion is there's no conclusion of what is the best way. Um, it is very challenging for our existing competition in infrastructure. We for sure would need deep learning models deployed as inference for the evaluation, um, which I'll talk about. We also need larger input data. Right now, most of our competition submissions are in CSV format, where you predict like a number or a label or something. This, we are asking people to generate so many numbers because they're images or, or, or text. They're also interesting that there's no ground truth in this, right? So it's everybody generate whatever and we'll give you a score. Um, so that goes to how do we evaluate generative models? One is manual, and that's the most accurate. Um, it is too subjective. It is also way too labor intensive, so um, logistically it won't work in our infrastructure. We need the machine to do it. It is more objective um, and more consistent, but it's actually really hard for machines to judge the quality of an image. Um, we're basically having these two distributions. One is the generated, distri generated data distribution, um, which is the green line here, and then the actual, like what you perceive the world kind of data uh, distribution, which is the blue one here. And we have these samples that you generate that are the red lines here. So um, we are using these samples to evaluate whether these two distributions are similar or how close are the two distributions. So I did some research, read a, a bunch of research papers, and um, it is controversial, uh, to say the least, to have a valuation metric for a generative model. And um, um, even this research paper that I, I really like lists all these different metrics and they're wildly different. Um, the, the conclusion that I have and will be the evaluation metric that we use eventually is something that is not is inspired by some of these papers. One of the most um, established metric for generative models or GANs are inception, is inception score. Um, this inception score basically takes a inception model uh, or anything that's off the shelf pre-trained model and use that to evaluate the generative uh, images. And why that is the case is because, let's say I'm asking you to generate a bunch of uh, uh, dogs, and um, basically I want the pre-trained models to, to tell me, I can, I can classify, I'm confident that this is a dog, um, and this is not a car, 
and this is not a, a cat. So um, in that, we use these pre-trained models that already have a perception of the world and are already kind of trained that way, and we have them vote, basically. And the lower the entropy is, it means it's more easily classified by the pre-trained classifiers, and that means it's better quality image. So we rely on these pre-trained models to tell us the saliency score. That's how good this image is from a human perceptive perception. However, if you just generate like this one beagle on the grass and you generate it for 10,000 times, you're probably gonna get a very good saliency score, but that you're, you're not doing a good job in generating images. Um, so that goes into diversity. So if you really understand what you're generating, you should have a very good diversity of the, the data you, that you're generating. So in inception score, this diversity score is calculated as also using a pre-trained model, what are the classes of these images that you're calculating? And if you repeatedly generate that beagle, you're not gonna get a very good score. But if you generate like all these different breeds of dogs that the classifier knows, then you'll get a good score. So in here, higher entropy means it's more evenly distributed. It means it's better diversity. The last one that is different from the inception score, but mentioned in a lot of context, is a lot of context is, the, is memorization. So this is what I worry about also for the Kaggle community. It's, it's, it's not just the Kaggle community, but it's more pronounced in the Kaggle community because people uh, try, to, try to cheat. Um, is uh, sometimes a model will memorize training data. So you, you, uh, even if you don't intentionally do it, well, in the Kaggle community, people will intentionally do it, is um, you're, 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 you're just gonna remember this Husky picture in your training, training data, and then you're just generating it while you're not really understanding what it is it that you should generate. So in memorization, we'll use k-nearest neighbor to calculate the distance between the closest image in the training data and the, um, and the generated image. So our choice is very similar to the inception score, but we're having a, a different um, metric. That's the Fréché inception distance, FID, plus the memorization distance. So it's something that, um, that, that we're gonna create. Um, it's a little more robust, a um, little uh, more robust against noise and distortion of the images, and it's more computationally efficient. Um, that is something that the research community doesn't consider, but in Kaggle, when we're in production, it's, uh, it's something that we have to consider um, a lot because you guys all expect your score in real time, right? So we, we, we need to compute very quickly. So, um, so yeah, so we decided to have this metric that is combining different aspects of generative models um, and, um, and we'll just uh, somehow normalize and multiply. I put a clause here that is not necessarily the final choice. I still might make some uh, modifications here. So how it'll be done, um, hopefully, is users will create a Kaggle kernel that is the training, and uh, it'll only take training data from what we provide. In this example, we're using dog images, so it'll be the ImageNet data. And generate the models, generate the images, click submit, and that submits as your competition results. And in the back end, we'll actually have all these Kaggle as another kernel as the evaluation script. Um, so that's actually making, making quite, a bit of diff quite a bit of changes to our back end infrastructure. While we have that metric and the calculated saliency score, the diversity score, and the memorization score, it will be, um, it will, the public, public leaderboard will be calculated from off the shelf uh, pre-trained models and the private leaderboard will be calculated from some mysterious pre-trained models trained from my dog's pictures um, that you won't have access to. So uh, hopefully that uh, re removes a little bit of concern about overfitting and also uh, hacking, the, hacking the scores. 
there are a lot of risks to this, so we're not going to say this is like super safe. Um, there's a lot of compute. You might not finish your you not might not finish your training in time. Uh, uh, GANs are actually really sensitive and really not easy to train. Um, you don't have to use GANs. You can use anything else. Uh, people could hack the metric because. Um, no metric is perfect, especially in this sense. Um, the research community is still really debating it. Um, people could submit internet images before hopefully we can mitigate this by kernels only with internet cutoff. Benefits, we really want to bring new skills for the community. And um, it's very different from previous competitions. It's like drastically different to generating things. You're not reading in um, things for you to get to predict. Um, I find it very addictive. I take it as one of the benefits. So, so that's, um, that's what I've been working on. Uh, and I'm very excited about it. Hopefully you will enjoy it. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I can't guarantee when it will come alive. But, um, uh, <laughs> but if we find a lot of uh, people hacking it, then, then it won't happen very soon. <laughs> um, Finally, we want to, other than that, other than the, the new types of competitions, we want to, we want to say that um, we respect the community's different ways of involvement in data science, which is why I was asking all these questions about uploading data sets and taking Kaggle Learn classes. We know not everybody learned the same way, and some people might like doing analysis more instead of predictive modeling. Some people might like taking a class at Learn instead of jumping into a competition that they're not familiar with. Um, and we want to provide all those different ways. We want to provide new content on Kaggle um, for people with different styles of learning and different styles and of involvement. So here are uh, Kaggle data sets and Kaggle Learn that are also on our platform, and I'm happy that sounds like a lot of people have been using them. I, I actually, I personally, am a fan of um, Kaggle Learn's explainable ML class. So that concludes my talk today. Um, I'm very excited to be here to hear all the talks today, and I hope you do too. And uh, welcome, and thank you for joining our large global family of Kaggle. <laughs>